I am absolutely delighted to introduce you today to Rob Henshaw, who in 1981 was the first person to kayak anti-clockwise round Ireland. And then in 1990, he sailed his laser round Ireland. And in 1992, he windsurfed round Ireland. And it doesn't stop there. In 2005, he sailed his Drascom round Ireland and slept in it. Uh, all with solo sailing. And again, there's, there's, there's more, as they say. In 2007, Rob sailed across the Atlantic. And in 2015, he went for a little bit more comfort and he sailed his steel catch around Ireland. He's with us today to tell us the story of some uh, various things that happened uh, when he was sailing his wonderful Contessa 32 that he bought in Portugal back to Ireland in 2001, the lovely Maria. So thank you very much for joining us here today, Rob. And to help Rob tell his story, I think we all know this person here sat on the left, Norman Keane, editor of ICC Sailing Directions, who sailed the Atlantic himself in 2001 and has many other nautical miles under his belt. He is the fellow, uh, a fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation, and you will actually see his name in Yachting Monthly. He writes articles regularly for them. So thank you so much for joining us here today. We're out in the horse and jockey, not an ocean to be found. Uh, thank you, Gail. Um, so Rob, um, tell me about Maria. Maria's uh, a lovely boat. I fell in love with her straight away when I found her online on the Contessa organization uh, website and uh, I've been wanting to change boats for a while and the problem was with COVID on she was in Portugal and I wasn't able to get out and see her and uh, I went however I, I, I purchased her she was 1975 Contessa 32 uh, gorgeous boat uh, good condition for her age and uh, she was in Porto Mayo in Portugal. Sight unseen and surveyed? Sight unseen, but I'd seen lots and lots and lots of photographs. The uh, previous owner had been very, very helpful and sent me extra photographs mm. and stuff like that. Uh, he did loads of work for me prior to my arrival. I had to cancel a couple of trips because of COVID. And I managed to get on the first flight out that was legitimate uh, to, to Faro uh, to see her. I think that was a sort of beginning of May mm. uh, last year, in 2021. And what did the yeah. surveyor recommend? Uh, yes, I had a fully surveyed, uh, both rigging and full hull survey, and the recommendations were absolutely minor. Uh, the previous owner managed to do some for me, and uh, all I was left with really was unkinking a couple of bilge pumps, mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. So she, she was ready, more well, or less. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, and tell me, what, what gear did you carry for the voyage? So someone bought already, but what did you also... What did you carry for an ocean I voyage? Sh I shipped out a whole pallet <laughs> of gear uh, from home in Enniskillen, uh, which the previous owner again, Jeff, he, he was very kind and did all the paperwork and stuff for me in relation to that. Uh, I had some spare sails shipped out as well, and he looked after all the paperwork for that. Uh, with, with Brexit, it was a bit of a problem, a bit of uh, money implications in relation to mm. stupid taxes and stuff like that. Mm. But uh, we managed to get that all sorted out. And um, I had um, uh, obviously the things like EPIRB, uh, a personal cable be beacon as well, it was an extra EPIRB. I fitted a new VHF radio, um, I fitted a small, uh, I, I fitted a small chart plotter, uh, which actually had an AIS transponder in it rather than just an AIS receiver because mm -hmm. I wanted to be uh, seen as well as mm -hmm. to be able to see other ships uh, for my crossing back home. You had a sat phone. A uh, sat phone, yeah, and a really go. Um, so I, I felt very well equipped in relation to safety, in relation yeah. to communications and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. You had a couple of bits of bad luck before you left Portimao. Yeah, I took a bit of a while preparing and fitting some, fitting some of the gear myself, uh, but I was just testing my really and go. Uh, I had it resting up on the, on the coach roof uh, just to get a clearer uh, reception. And I reached up and got it, and unfortunately dropped it as I was uh, as I was bringing it down. And the blade wouldn't turn on again, and um, so I was a bit a bit devastated. But at the same time, uh, I knew could I knew I could survive without it. But uh, I was a bit upset because yes. I wasn't able to get predict wind uh, then, and you know, I had to do a lot of planning in advance at each stage. 
and um, it was a bit of an upset. But uh, you know, so I lost my communications with uh, by phone yeah. for for weather reception and um, emails. How was like how was your trip to Madeira? Um, weather progress? Oh, the weather was delightful. It was beautiful. Uh, reach all the way. Um, I think I did it in quite quick time. It was about three and a half days, mm-hmm. or just over three days, uh, for the four and fifty miles or whatever. And uh, uh, <coughs> delightful blue seas, a oh, wonderful light. And then it was only the, the last day. Got up, wind got up to about four, four five, six, mm-hmm. and had a lovely, lovely last, lovely last day mm-hmm. sailing to into Porto Santo, uh, one of the, uh, the Madeira yeah. And, yeah. and then on to Santa Maria and Terceira and the Azores. And how was that? Absolutely, yeah. No, I went to Santa Maria next. Was I felt I had to? We were both staying yes. safe. Uh, and a uh, uh, <clears throat> lovely couple of days on Santa Maria. Uh, again, a very easy sail, and uh, but 500 miles, about four and a half days, I think it was. And, and then from Santa Maria, I went on to, uh, was it to Sierra? Yes, to Sierra. 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 Yes, to Sierra. Yes. And I uh, spent a few days in uh, to Sierra before pre- preparing, well, I was preparing from the last day, looking for the right window, weather window, because I was able to use my iPad for whilst on land for uh, weather updates through predict wind and stuff like that. There was another contestor in, 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 uh, in, in this year as well. They were going to head, head, heading back to um, heading back to Southwest Cork and they weren't quite ready so they were sort of a few days behind me. And there was also a boat uh, heading off to, to Greenland uh, for uh, whale solicitation. Uh, oh surveys and expeditions, and they, they left the same day as I did, and the so, weather window looked good. So you were happy enough leaving Tercia, uh, confident in the boat? I was very confident in the boat, with no problems so far, you know, when I, you know put it over a thousand miles under me, whatever, so I was happy that, uh, you know, that the, for the last leg was going to go well, the boat was sailing well, going sound, and um, yeah, so it was, it was good. But How then, was your weather after leaving Tercia? Not what I expected. <laughs> I was expecting lovely, you know, maybe light four spores, whatever, and uh, blue seas and everything like that. But uh, my plan was to head north for a couple hundred miles before picking up sort of southwesterly airstreams uh, to take me to towards Ireland. And it didn't happen. So having headed north for a couple hundred miles, I was then hit uh, by my first gale. And um, seas were quite tough. And um, after a day in the, in the gale, I... Order helm, my self steering rather, my wind vane self steering snapped a yeah. uh, uh, steel rod up the middle of my, it, 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 it sheared, and there was no way I could uh, repair it at sea without getting it welded. And just one of the pieces of equipment I didn't have on board was a welder, having got rid of my steel boat. <laughs> <laughs> but and you, uh, you, you, I mean, that was a, that was a big problem, but you, you had a, an electronic autopilot. Yeah, my order helm uh, was working well because I'd used it a fair bit. Uh, if at all, when I was motoring in light winds, um, say across uh, in, the, in the Azores, and um, but it struggled under the under the, the wave conditions of the gale, and 24 hours after my sail vane uh, broke, the order helm fried itself, and again was irreparable. Despite examining the the wiring and stuff like that, you know, the feed in and it just packed in. Mm-hmm. But you were able to get the boat to self steer on a reach. Yes, um, yeah, I, I managed to uh, just trim the sails in such a way that I could sail the boat upwind or to, to a reach, and uh, that would suffice with the, the right balance of the sails and the right size of sail percent to the wind, mm-hmm. with a mixture of um, uh, reef genoa or staysail, which I had on, on <coughs> in a foresail, in a, in a staysail and uh, obviously getting the right reef in the, in the main. I could, I could steer the boat to, to a certain degree. And you were... I happened to be actually at the, actually at the helm, I'm very bulgy and, and so on. You were, you were heaving to uh, uh, to get some sleep. Um, how, did that, how did that go? Was it enough to keep you alert and fully functional? Well, certainly in the middle of the first gale, I did heave to and got a little bit of sleep, but with waves crashing on the, on the deck occasionally, you, do, you don't actually get that much sleep. It's still a long way to go. I think my first gale was right here. Yeah. And uh, I still had a long way to go to go to Ireland and I was lacking in sleep already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, 
you were leaving to to get some sleep. Was that was that enough to keep you alert and fully functional? Not really, because I was already getting pretty tired. Um, during the first gale, which was a couple of days, I did heave to during the night, uh, but I hardly got any sleep uh, due to waves crashing on the deck and so on. It, it tends to tends to disturb you quite a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, then the wind went aft, and you you hand steered for a while. But then you recalled a technique you'd read about. Tell me about that. Yes. So the problem is you're unable to go beyond uh, beyond a reach uh, with uh, with no without being on the helm, no rigging up, rigging, working with bungees and ropes on the tiller and things like that. Um, I, I slept on it during the night, and uh, I suddenly remembered I had a book on board. I'm not plugging in his book, but very good. <laughs> single hand and sailing thoughts, tips, techniques, and tactics by Andrew Evans. It's very, very good. You show us all um, the front cover there, Rob. You want to show it again? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. super. Well, let's just zoom in on that for everyone. There we go. That's the book yeah. that helped him. Yeah, I had a number of books with me, and uh, yeah. and I remember, I've never actually practiced it or done it before myself, uh, but I opened the book up and almost at the right page. Yeah. Uh, and remembered what I needed to do. So I rigged the storm drip jib on the staysail yeah. and uh, by running a line, by running a sheet uh, on the windward side of the boat through the cars and back through a tiller, a uh, pulley at right angles to the tiller. You wrap the, uh, the sheet <coughs> from the storm jib around the tiller and it steers the boat for you. It's absolutely, yeah. absolutely Perfect. bliss. Yeah. It's really wonderful. Yeah. I didn't get just yeah. beyond a, a broad reach. Okay. And uh, but the winds were light, and uh, as I yes. said, they were aft, and and I uh, tried other things as well. I um, pulled out the the reef genoa, and uh, with the reef main as well, uh, the boat would steer a bit downwind. But I really had to be on the yeah. on the on the on the tiller. I was, I think, I was around about around about here, and the second storm started, uh, well, strong gale, and the winds were up to four seven, touching eight. And uh, I was totally reefed down with storms and stuff like that. I know I had the um, uh, uh, the staysail, staysail jib flying, mm -hmm. and um, I think it was about six o'clock in the morning. I was in close hauled, and suddenly there was a big loud crack, and I knew straight away what had happened. And on deck, I could see that the U boat. Uh, for the uppers, and they, yeah, had, it snapped, mm. and the mast had folded in half, and I was pretty, pretty shocked because I was well, by this stage I was probably 150 plus miles from from Ireland, and uh, with no sail steering, no sailing now. Yeah. I knew I was going to have to motor the last 150 miles, and I was already absolutely exhausted, totally exhausted, mm -hmm. totally lacking in sleep. But I got all cleared up. Uh, got the, the, luckily, it was the staysail up, so I got the, the, the uh, furl genoa lashed to the side mm -hmm. of the boat. Uh, the folded mast got it secured and tied in, and got cleared up within the hour. Yeah. And it was under, under motor, but with a long way to go. You had a good engine and you had plenty of diesel. I had stacks of diesel, I had enough for 400 mile, mm -hmm. uh, so I had ample diesel, and um, which I just needed to manage now and get home safely, mm -hmm. and hopefully stay awake for the next couple of days, you know? But you had to hand steer. I had to hand steer, yeah. You hand steered for 36 hours or so, I, I, and exhaustion really started to take its toll. How, how did you feel? Yeah, well, during, during that sort of last 36 hours of, of, of helming the boat itself, uh, as I had to once she, she was motoring, no order and things like that, I was getting tired and tired and uh, I'd already been hallucinating a little bit orally, uh, but I was napping off at the helm and suddenly waking up with a fright. I could see, really see, rocks, cliffs I was about to run into. And I knew I was over, over tired and uh, because I was hallucinating. And it was quite, quite uh, perturbing. And but I kept on going. And in retrospect, I should have just stopped and slept. But it was still quite rough the last um, sort of thirty-six hours or so, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
I wasn't worried because I was so tired. I was just sort of didn't think there was any problem. I knew I was getting close to home. I thought I could just keep going and going mm-hmm. and going. Uh, I knew I was getting low on fuel, not uh, so I, you know, I four twenty liter cans on board. So I brought two up on deck to uh, top her up. You couldn't actually leave fuel up through the fill on deck. I couldn't because seawater was still rushing down the sides of the boats and, and uh, we got water straight into my tank. So I, um, I still had the wits about me that I could, I knew what I should do. And I, what I did was I undid the, um, I lifted the lazarette lid and uh, there's a transparent tube which shows you how much fuel I've got yeah. uh, aboard. So I disconnected the top of that, uh, rigged up a, a siphon jiggler at the top of the tube and managed to decant um, almost, you know, probably three quarters of the contents of a 20 litre drum into the tank. It took some time and uh, I was going to do another one, uh, put another half to 10 or so litres in and uh, I was so tired I couldn't. So I thought I'll do that in the morning, yeah. And she ran out. <sighs> she ran out hours, obviously many hours later and uh, whilst I was still hallucinating and hearing voices and stuff like that, the engine went silent, the voices stopped, thank goodness, and I almost cursed the silence because I knew what had happened, I'd run, run the tank dry, run the engine dry, and I thought, no problem, okay, I'll top up with fuel again and just bleed her and get going. But I hadn't practiced bleeding uh, the animal before, uh, before leaving, which I should have done, and uh, I couldn't find the lift pump at the back of the engine. But it's not rocket science. I mean, you, you know, that's, that should be an easy point. You were just so tired. I've, I've bled an engine many, many times before, but yeah. not this engine, which was new to me. I was just so tired. I had the engine manual on the chart table beside me, yeah. and I didn't have the wit about me to look at the picture yeah. to see where the lift pump was. Yeah. And anyway, I tried over and over again, um, and. Uh, the batteries, I felt, were getting low and dangerously low to the extent that we couldn't get us started anyway. Again, in retrospect, I should have maybe gone to sleep and slept on it yeah. and uh, dealt with it because this time the wind was actually dropping and it would have been okay just drifting. Um, but I, I, I thought, ah, I'll, I'll phone the previous owner who's been so helpful to me in the past and things like that in preparation yeah, for the boat. You, had, you were close enough there, I don't know, you had mobile signal. I had mobile signal, yeah. yeah. So I rang him up and he he talked me through it again and again, but I couldn't find the lift pump. Still couldn't find the lift pump, and uh, I was just so exhausted. I was breaking down through exhaustion and frustration and desperation. And uh, and you phoned. He he, he 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 advised Rob. You're so close. You're only what 15 yeah. miles offshore. Phone for phone for help. Phone for help. You know. And I didn't want to. It was all in all, all my other trips. I've been totally self-resilient and managed to get out of any difficulties I've been in. And, um, but I took his advice and was very grateful for it. Uh, I forgot what to do though. I didn't know, I didn't know how to vote for help. <laughs> I was that exhausted. And, uh, but I did have the telephone number of um, uh, Crosshaven Boatyard Marina on, on my chart table, because that's where I was, or had all to coast from originally heading towards for, for, for Dingle, as you can see from here. Um, I'd also cause for uh, Crosshaven where I could get my cell phone, my wind vane re- repaired, and you, I could get a new auto helm there and carry on up the west coast to, to Sligo, which was my original intention. Mm-hmm. And um, so you phoned Crosshaven, boy. yeah, yeah, I, in tears again. I had a lovely lady called Judy um, who said, Rob, Rob, relax, you're okay, you know, um, just give me your position and I'll sort the, the lifeboat out for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to tell you, I, I was very relieved after the call uh, because having resigned to the fact that I was going to get towed in the last 15 miles was, it was, it was, it was a, lot, a huge relief, but, but I was just so exhausted, so, so exhausted. I've never been this tired before in my life. Yeah. So you, you were brought into Coke McSherry and that's where we, I came round because I, I knew the call was going on and I came round and met this yeah. triple boat coming in and we realised we knew each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what would you say the lessons are for us in your experience? Probably there's a multitude of lessons, but uh, I think the main one 
for me because it was just a simple thing that really went wrong at the end, which is the, the breaking of the U-boat, that without a doubt I should have um, should have replaced them before uh, setting off from Porto Mayo, Portugal. I just didn't think to. I was sort of anxious to, to leave Porto Mayo to get on my journey home. And, um, and so I never, never considered, I never considered it a necessity. Was the boat had been surveyed and a rigging inspection as well, and I didn't think it was necessary. But I was, I was very wrong. It could happen to anybody. Yes. And as far as the, the, the sleep deprivation and exhaustion, anything, what's your advice for the rest of us? Well, had I not been solo, that wouldn't have been a problem. Yeah. Um, but I think sailing solo on a long trip is, is, is an experience in itself, which is, which is worth having, worth taking the risk. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful experience to be out in the ocean, uh, sailing by yourself, miles, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles maybe from, from anybody else. It's just it's brilliant. Um, there's so much I should have, I could have done. I could have, I could have slept more. I could, should have hove to more on the last leg of the journey. Um, had I been slept more, I wouldn't have maybe uh, got to the state of exhaustion that I got myself into. Could have carried a spare auto helm. I could have carried spares for my wind vane, which I didn't. And um, I, had, I had a generator on board, so I could have recharged my batteries, which I just forgot about it. Yeah. I should have taken my time. I perhaps shouldn't have been so anxious to get home. Mm. And uh, I would have managed to get some more sleep and sort the problem out and work it all out in the end. But, but fully but, self resilient. But Maria and you survived. Miriam and I survived, yeah. And Maria will fight another day. She'll fight another day, getting a new new mast yeah. uh, in a few days' time. And Rob, a few weeks' time. And Rob will fight a few more days as well. And I'll have a few more adventures, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. In recognition of Rob's courageous warts and all account of his voyage, where he and Maria, the lovely Maria, experienced dreadful weather and unexpected gear failure, was awarded the highly regarded top award, the Faulkner Cup for best cruise of the season and the Atlantic Trophy from the Irish Cruising Club. Congratulations, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I was delighted to receive those unexpected awards and I thank the ICC very sincerely for, for them. Uh, but I'd also like to thank uh, the wonderful Judy of Crosshaven, uh, Boatyard Marina, who, who relayed my, uh, my distress. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, the RNLI, the guys, everybody that's involved in the Cork Sherry lifeboat who came out to give me a tow in the last 15 miles. I was very relieved. Thank you. <laughs>